This is the Argument Ninja Podcast, episode 14. Hi, everyone. I am Kevin Delplant, and I'm recording this on Monday, December 19th, 2016. Six days before Christmas. It is bitterly cold outside here in Ottawa, Canada, but it's cozy here at home. One of the benefits of working from home, you don't have to brave the cold weather and traffic to get to work. On this episode, I'm going to talk about the various ways that curiosity, genuine curiosity, is an undervalued resource for critical thinking. I'll try to explain how curiosity plays an important role in generating the kind of background knowledge that supports critical thinking and why it has important and underrated debiasing properties, meaning that it can reduce many of the harmful effects of cognitive biases on our thinking. I'm also going to talk about my personal relationship to curiosity and how it has influenced many of the decisions I've made in my career. Now, if you're just coming off of episode 13, this isn't exactly the topic I advertised. These things change. Sometimes I go with what I'm currently thinking about, and right now, Seeing how polarized the political climate is, I've been thinking about how different things would be if more people were not just interested, but genuinely curious about how the other side thinks. I think things would be very different, and this episode is partly my attempt to explain why I think so. And in the last episode, I said I would give a business update too, but that's not going to happen either. I'm going to save that for the next episode. My business situation is in so much flux right now, I don't want to announce anything that won't still be true a week after the episode airs, so please bear with me on that. If this is your first time catching this show, you should know that I run a video tutorial site called the Critical Thinker Academy, which you can find at criticalthinkeracademy.com. It has over 20 hours of video content on a wide range of topics related to critical thinking, logic and argumentation, fallacies, cognitive biases, and more. I've been running this site for a number of years under a number of different business models, but my goal for the past while has been to attract what I'm calling sustaining members. Sustaining members are fans of my work who are willing to pledge a small amount of money on a recurring monthly basis to help me pay my bills and turn what I'm doing into a sustainable business that will let me devote all of my energies to creating new content and develop new projects like the Argument Ninja Academy program that I've been talking about over the past few episodes. If you're familiar with Patreon, a sustaining membership is like becoming a patron, and I do have a Patreon page where you can sign up if that's your preference. You can find that at patreon.com forward slash Kevin Delaplante. What I've been offering for the past couple of months is a deal where if you pledge as little as $3 a month, either through the sign-up forms at the Academy or on Patreon, you get full access to all of the content at the Critical Thinker Academy including any new video courses I make for as long as you maintain your subscription. And on top of that, I'm offering an early reserved seat in the Argument Ninja training program locked in at the same monthly rate. If you're interested in this, you can visit criticalthinkeracademy.com or argumentninja.com to learn more. Okay, let's get to our main topic for this episode. We know that critical thinking depends crucially on background knowledge. You have to know something about your subject matter to make good critical judgments about that subject. But knowledge, relevant knowledge, is not compartmentalized in the way that it may seem when you're in school and you're forced to study science separate from math and separate from history and separate from social studies. There may be good reasons to separate subjects like this for teaching purposes, especially teaching large numbers of students all at once. But applied knowledge, the kind you need to think clearly and effectively about complex problems or new situations, doesn't respect these boundaries. And you shouldn't either. Knowledge doesn't come in the form of unconnected facts. It comes in the form of interconnected links. It's a network that grows and evolves and becomes more structured and articulated over time. In episodes 9 and 10, I talked about argument matrices as a model for a certain kind of knowledge that is important for critical thinking. But the broader concept is this more general notion of a web or matrix of connections. Our capacity for understanding and insight is a direct function of the structure of the interconnected web of knowledge that we carry around with us, and our ability to access and navigate and manipulate the information contained in this web, and have it inform our judgments and decisions. 
some of this can be externalized. Google is very good for this. Books can be very good for this. But the limiting factor in your ability to apply knowledge in effective and creative ways is always going to be you and the structure of your personal knowledge web. So we need to find ways of developing and expanding this web. Now, I don't know of any way to force this process. The only mechanism I know that reliably works to build a knowledge web that is structured to support critical thinking is curiosity and self-directed learning that is aimed at satisfying curiosity. This process of tapping into what you're really curious about, what really interests you, and initiating some kind of investigation that is motivated, at least in part, by curiosity, and that gradually starts to satisfy your curiosity. This, for me, is one of the most intrinsically satisfying experiences that human beings are capable of. And if you allow yourself to branch off and follow digressions just because you're curious about them, that's good. That's how connections are made. That's how you grow the web. The key here is that this web of knowledge, when it's constructed this way, is both more highly articulated and much more accessible to you when a situation presents itself and you need to call upon it. When you are the author of the links in this web, they're more deeply internalized. They become a part of your representational system. They persist long after other facts you've been forced to learn have faded from memory. There's a study that bears on this, though I can't remember the source, unfortunately. It shows how unstable rote learning can be. Students are taking a high school English class and they have an upcoming test on Friday. They do a review in class, the normal test prep. Students study for the test and then they take the test on Friday. The tests are graded and recorded. Now, unbeknownst to the students, when they arrive in class on Monday, they're given the exact same test to take again. So how do you think the score is compared? The test scores on Monday for the exact same test taken just three days earlier were 30% lower on average. Obviously, much of that information packed into short-term memory, timed just right to retrieve it on Friday, gets purged almost immediately afterward. Now, you can test students on the content they studied in a class one month, six months, and five years after completing the class. And probably no surprise, the amount of knowledge that is retained decays very quickly. For some students, it doesn't take long for them to effectively return to their pre-class state. It's like they never took the class. And for many, the amount that is retained, you could summarize on one sheet of paper. Now, the exceptions are students who continue to work and study in areas directly related to the class content, where the concepts are used and reinforced. That's not surprising. And the other exception is students who were really invested in learning the material and found much of it intrinsically interesting. They retain more and they retain more for longer. Now, again, not surprising. We can all relate to this. We're all nerdy experts in something. And this is exactly how our nerdy expertise grows. So I think the lesson we should draw from this as people who want to improve our critical thinking skills is that we should think of this natural way of learning as a resource for critical thinking. So my critical thinking tip is twofold. One, we need to find ways of cultivating curiosity about the subjects that we want to think critically about, that we think are important to understand. And that's an interesting challenge if we aren't naturally curious about it from the start. And two, we need to find ways of satisfying our curiosity through self-directed learning. Now, this second part is much easier than the first part. If you're genuinely curious, it's not hard to find ways to learn more about the subject. That's just the way curiosity works. But if you're not naturally curious about a subject, or you have a preconception that the subject is boring or dry or too technical for you, that's a harder situation to fix. So is there anything we can do to make ourselves more curious? Well, I think it's a tough question, but here's a useful distinction to keep in mind. There are at least two distinct forms that curiosity takes. One is the curiosity evoked by an event that you don't understand that prompts you to explore and learn more about it, like hearing sounds from outside your house or seeing a flash of light in the nighttime sky or getting a gift from your secret Santa at work and wondering who it's from or seeing a surprising demonstration of a scientific phenomena on television. You feel drawn to investigate these events. In the literature on the psychology of curiosity, this is called state curiosity or task curiosity or situational curiosity. 
It's a temporary state that is evoked by some ongoing internal or external activity. Every normally functioning person experiences this kind of curiosity, but it's episodic. It's triggered by events, and it eventually fades. The other kind of curiosity is the kind you associate with people as a character trait, a disposition that they always have. Curious George the monkey is naturally curious about everything. Scientists often talk about wanting to go into science to satisfy their natural curiosity about the world. We all know people who we think of as more or less curious than others. Now, this kind of curiosity isn't completely indiscriminate, of course. Most people are more curious about some aspects of the world and less curious about others. My mother was intensely curious about religion and spiritual topics, and she read voraciously on these topics. But she wasn't curious at all about science or the scientific view of the world. This kind of curiosity that we're talking about is called trait curiosity, or individual curiosity, or dispositional curiosity. It's a persisting feature of a person's mental attitude and how they engage with the world. Now, from a learning standpoint, it's this latter form of curiosity that plays the bigger role in predicting whether a person will pursue an investigation over an extended period of time that results in lasting knowledge. This kind of curiosity does vary across populations, like most traits do. I would bet $1,000 that most of you listening to this podcast are at the higher end of the curiosity distribution. You are not a random sample. So you and I have both had that experience of being frustrated by the lack of curiosity that your friends or members of your family seem to display in the face of something that you find utterly fascinating. And you know that powerful feeling of connection when you find someone that matches your level of curiosity and interest in a subject that matters to you. Being curious and finding ways to satisfy your curiosity is a pleasurable experience. But even more pleasurable is sharing that experience with other people who feel the same way. Now, this kind of trait curiosity can be a hard thing to change. There's evidence for a genetic component, but early developmental conditions are a big factor too. Children learn to express curiosity and take pleasure from curiosity or suppress their curiosity from parents and from peers and from their learning environment. So the good news is that environment can play a big role. And there's lots of room for modeling and positive reinforcement to have an impact on the degree to which one ends up being naturally curious. And another good bit of news is that curiosity is contagious in a group. If you want to learn more about politics or history or economics or philosophy, and you're not naturally curious about these subjects, one strategy is to find a group of people who are naturally curious and plunk yourself in the middle of them you'll find yourself mirroring their curiosity and their interest without even trying. And then you may suddenly find yourself reading long Wikipedia entries on fascism or Watergate or the efficient market hypothesis or the problem of induction, not because you have to, but because you find that you've become genuinely interested. Now, I want to transition to another topic relating to curiosity. And this one's very important. Curiosity isn't just a resource for acquiring knowledge that supports critical thinking. It also has powerful de-biasing effects, and in that respect, it's a tool for overcoming the distorting effects of many cognitive biases. For example, there's a whole family of biases involving group identity and how people are perceived within groups and outside of groups. What's known as out-group homogeneity bias, for example, involves viewing people outside your group as more similar to one another, more homogeneous than are people within your own group. And this can dispose us to stereotyping and failing to see the diversity that actually exists within those groups. There's also what's known as in-group favoritism bias and out-group negativity bias. We tend to value people and traits associated with our in-group more than people and traits associated with out-groups. And we're more willing to punish or place burdens on people in out-groups than people within our own group. We're all vulnerable to social biases like these. In an intensely polarized political environment, like the one we're seeing right now in the United States, and in many other places around the world, where tribal thinking is being reinforced, the distorting effects of these biases are even stronger. Now, in an environment like this, people become very interested in these different group identities. They may become obsessed with them. But interest can be motivated in all sorts of ways that aren't conducive to critical thinking. If I see myself as a partisan member of one of these groups, 
a card-carrying progressive liberal, a staunch feminist, a committed Make America Great Again Trump supporter, a white nationalist, a Black Lives Matter activist, then my interest can be partisan as well, motivated by a desire to take a stand, to advocate for and defend my side, to understand the enemy, and so on. This kind of partisan interest, if it dominates our psychology, is almost always an obstacle to critical thinking because it feeds into two important cognitive biases, confirmation bias and motivated reasoning that make us even more prone to error, that amplify the distortion rather than reducing it. Now, this is not to say that partisan interest doesn't serve a useful function. It does. But it's primarily a defensive function, a conservative function. It's a mechanism for maintaining a stable, coherent identity in the face of forces that threaten to destabilize it. In this respect, it's related to the phenomenon of cognitive dissonance and our natural instinct to reduce internal stress by reinterpreting our experience in ways that remove contradictions in our thinking and between our thinking and our behavior. And now think of how different our psychology is when our interest is driven by curiosity, genuine curiosity, which is rooted in vulnerability, a willingness to admit uncertainty and ignorance and an openness to surprise, to having our expectations overturned. Genuine curiosity takes delight in the prospect of learning something new, something unexpected. This is how genuine curiosity can be a powerful debiasing agent. It pushes us to see through group boundaries and to take an interest in individuals as individuals in all their complexity and particularity. This is the opposite of partisan interest. Genuine curiosity opens us up to novelty and to expounding the boundaries of what is known and what is possible. But it does so at the cost of making us vulnerable to new ways of thinking that can be stressful and destabilizing. Partisan interest is driven to minimize this vulnerability by looking for ways of reinforcing the contours of our psychological and social identities, the ones we've worked so hard to build. Now, at any given time, each of us is driven by some mixture of different kinds of interests. None of us are motivated solely by curiosity. That's not realistic. And it wouldn't be ideal from a critical thinking perspective either. Our conservative impulses are valuable too. They provide the glue that binds our identity into a cohesive whole, without which we can't function properly. But with that said, I do believe that in many cases, we can improve our critical thinking by cultivating and engaging our capacity for genuine curiosity. Just to give a cartoonishly simple example, imagine that our motivation structure is a product of two sources, partisan interest and interest driven by genuine curiosity, and that you could adjust the magnitude of these two sources of interest by adjusting knobs or sliders. For a given person on a given topic, there will be default settings. For example, I have a relative who has become very concerned with the threat of Muslim culture infiltrating Canada, spread of Sharia law, and so on. She reads the same online blog sites over and over that repeat the same threatening messages, and she'll admit that she's afraid of Muslims as a group. She sees them as a threat, and she gets very agitated by the topic. It brings up a lot of emotion. When you're around her, you quickly learn that it's not a safe subject for conversation. So for this relative of mine, her partisan interest dial is jacked way high. It dominates her motivational psychology. But you wouldn't describe her as curious about Muslim culture and Islam and Sharia law. She couldn't tell you the difference between Shia and Sunni Muslims, or distinguish between Islam, Islamism, and Jihadism. She doesn't go out of her way to educate herself about these topics. Her genuine curiosity dial is set really low. Now, if I could somehow reach into her head and adjust those proportions to something like 50-50, so that she would be equally motivated by genuine curiosity as by partisan interest, that alone would make a huge difference to her capacity to think critically about this topic. It would drive her to expand her background knowledge in relevant areas, get a sense of how different sides argue their case, and open her up to new ways of thinking about the issue. So this is another way of thinking of curiosity as a resource for critical thinking. If I can find ways of cultivating not just concern, not just interest, but a genuine curiosity about a topic, that mindset will, over time, make me a better critical thinker on that topic. 
Now, I was going to wrap up here, but this topic is actually quite personal for me. It speaks to my identity more than anything else I can think of. I went back and forth on whether it would be helpful to talk about my own relationship to curiosity, but obviously I've decided to, so here goes. In every class I've ever taught, I've recognized students who are smarter than me, regardless of their age. In my professional career as an academic, I was surrounded by people who I recognized as smarter, more intelligent than me. More intelligent in the sense of fluid intelligence, the kind of intelligence that IQ tests are good at measuring. Now, I recognize that I'm a reasonably intelligent guy, intelligent enough to earn an honors degree in physics, intelligent enough to get through graduate school in philosophy, a field that prides itself on cleverness, intelligent enough to write and publish academic papers, enough to get tenure at a top research university, enough to earn the respect of my much smarter colleagues. But intelligence was never a thing that set me apart from my peers or my colleagues. What I believe has set me apart from a very young age is an unusually high degree of curiosity that can be activated, it seems, by almost anything. Curiosity manifests itself in focus and attention. When I was a kid, it wasn't hard or unusual for me to spend hours reading and thinking about a subject. I'd stay on a topic for a while, read as much as I could until my curiosity was satisfied, or I'd hit a saturation point, and then I'd just move on to something else. There was no effort involved. It was a deeply pleasurable thing for me to spend my time doing. And I'd jump from topic to topic as the mood hit me. I'd start reading about scuba diving and undersea exploration, and then jump to learning about submersibles, and then about the physics and chemistry of air pressure, and why people get the bends when they surface from underwater too quickly. And then I'd jump over to sharks, and the evolution of sharks and rays, and then to the evolution of life on Earth, and so on. All of this stuck with me longer than it would have if I'd been forced to learn it for school, because of the way the linkages in this knowledge web were driven by curiosity. After high school, I chose physics as my undergraduate major, not because I was especially good at math, or especially good at solving physics problems, but because the subject itself spoke to my natural curiosity, which pushed me to ask more and more foundational questions. I eventually went on to philosophy for the same reasons, not because I was especially deep or clever or good at logic, but because it was a field where I knew I could indulge my curiosity across the widest range of subjects, from the very applied to the very abstract. And people do notice this about me. In grad school and in my academic career, I had a reputation as someone who had serious interests in a lot of different areas and who knew a lot about a lot of different areas. I didn't have a master plan for how to put all of this together. I was just curious about a lot of things. Now, this indiscriminate curiosity helped me as a teacher and as a colleague, but it probably didn't help my career as a researcher. Academic publishing really demands a singular focus on a particular subject, working on problems of a particular sort. Almost all of the writing you do is aimed at convincing a small audience of academic peers that you've made a valuable contribution to our understanding of these problems. A true academic, with a capital A, is someone who enjoys this process and is dedicated to getting better at it. I was never a true academic in this sense. I was only ever interested in studying a topic or writing about a topic until I had satisfied my curiosity about it, at least temporarily. And then I wanted to move on to the next topic, like when I was a kid. But you can't do that and have a career in academia. You can't flit from topic to topic like a bee moving from flower to flower. You have to stick with one flower or one variety of flower and keep visiting it over and over. That's how you build a professional reputation as an expert in your field. And it's the same with teaching. As a professor, you get slotted into teaching a certain small number of classes, which you are destined to teach over and over. There are many courses that you will never be allowed to teach, even if you're interested and you're qualified to teach them, either because your program just doesn't offer them, or because someone else in your department already has a claim on those courses. These are some of the reasons why I ended up leaving academia, and why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Working independently, creating courses for the Academy and for Udemy, I can indulge my curiosity more than I ever could as a university professor. Now, do I enjoy making the courses themselves? Absolutely. And there are two reasons why. One, they're how I get to learn what I want to learn, what I don't fully understand yet. They're the vehicle through which I get to satisfy my curiosity. And two, remember when I talked about the pleasure of finding other people who share your curiosity? 
When I'm working on a video, I'm imagining some person on the other side watching it and either becoming interested in the same things that I'm interested in or feeling like they've learned something new that helps them to satisfy their own curiosity. So the work feels like I'm sharing something valuable. I want to create opportunities for other people to experience the same pleasure that I do when I've learned something new that makes me think about the world in a different way. Even though we may not be in the same room sharing the same space, I love the idea that you and I may now be sharing a common thought about something that you may never have thought of before or thought of in quite this way. In the end, I'm not interested in providing answers to questions so much as in sharing the sense of delight and wonder that I feel at the opportunity to contemplate these questions. So you can see how my relationship to curiosity is a big deal for me. It's been a driver for a lot of my big life decisions. Now, earlier I described a motivational psychology that has inputs from two sources, what I called partisan interest and genuine curiosity. The family relative that I mentioned, the one who was very concerned about Muslims, but not curious about Islam, her default dial setting was high on partisan interest and low on curiosity, at least with respect to this issue. If I were to use this model on myself to diagnose my own motivational psychology, I would say that I'm pretty much the opposite of this. My curiosity dial is set high and my partisan interest dial is set low. Those seem to be my default settings on many topics. Now, this isn't necessarily an ideal motivational psychology, all things considered. For critical thinking purposes and teaching purposes, it's pretty good. But for other purposes, maybe not so much. A friend of mine once told me that for someone who is as interested in politics as much as I am, it's surprising how little I care about politics. I think this is a useful description. And with the distinction we've just drawn, I think I understand it better. What high curiosity and low partisan interest means is that it's easy for me to become interested in a topic and want to study and learn more about it, but it's harder for me to care too much about it in the sense of being invested in which side of a debate is correct or which outcome is preferred. When Donald Trump won the election, for example, my reaction wasn't the sea of pain that my liberal friends were sharing on social media. I didn't grieve for the Democrats' loss, and I didn't celebrate Trump's win. I had a lot of feelings, but mixed in were feelings of excitement and gratitude. Gratitude for what? Gratitude that now I get to see how this timeline turns out. I was never curious about how the future would go if Hillary won. That's the status quo timeline. I was intensely curious about how the future would go if Trump won, since the future beyond this point is genuinely obscure. I felt grateful that I get to be a witness to an historical event of this size. Now, I'm not entirely comfortable admitting this, because when there's this much at stake, there's something off-putting about taking pleasure in chaos and uncertainty. And there are political issues that really do deserve attention and concern. And we should feel strongly about different possible outcomes, because these outcomes have real consequences for real people. So if I feel a certain detachment from these outcomes, that's probably good for my psychological health because I don't tend to get stressed over them. And it's good from a critical thinking standpoint because my perception isn't as clouded by partisan bias. But it may not be so good from an ethical standpoint or a democratic citizenship standpoint because sometimes the situation demands that we stand up and take a side and fight for what we think is really important. And in cases like this, I actually think it would be better overall if my partisan interest settings were tuned a little higher. Now, I want to mention one last thing before I wrap up. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk about curiosity and my relationship to curiosity is that I want you, my audience, to better understand where I'm coming from with respect to the topics that I discuss and what broader agendas I may or may not have. I feel a need to do this because, as my inbox will testify, my work seems to attract people who have strong partisan interests and who see me or want to see me as an ally, someone who might share their ideological or political mission, or who are bothered by an agenda that they perceive in the topics that I cover, that they disapprove of. So according to some of my emails, I'm an atheist selling elitist liberal propaganda, and I'm a religious apologist and a Trump supporter. And since I've talked about hypnosis and seduction, I must also be sympathetic to the men's rights movement and the anti-feminist, anti-PC, 
red pill worldview. And because I talk a lot about learning to think for yourself and the value of freedom, I must be a libertarian and a critic of government regulation. And because I've talked about conspiracies and propaganda and mind control methods, I must be sympathetic to some kind of grand conspiracy theory. Now, I'm not surprised by this. The people who make these assumptions probably aren't used to hearing someone talk about these topics who isn't also a partisan supporter of some kind. So let me just say up front, I don't identify with any of these labels or these agendas. And maybe now you can better understand why. What I am is curious about these topics. I want to understand them, and I think it's useful that more people understand them. But I don't particularly care about them. My motivations are driven mainly by curiosity, not by partisan interest. When I say that I don't particularly care about them, what I mean is that there are lots of things I care about just as much. I'm just as curious about black holes and the origin of the universe as I am about persuasion techniques and cognitive biases. I'm just as curious about how I'm able to voluntarily bend my finger right now just by thinking about it as I am about which political philosophy is the correct one. I'm just as curious about the nature of language and how language can represent the world as I am about whether 9-11 was an inside job. I'm just as curious about how artists create their art as about whether there is or isn't a god. That's not the psychology of a person with an ideological agenda. The one partisan interest that I do strongly identify with is this. I wish more people had the opportunity to live self-directed lives that are worthy of the rational, creative beings we are. It really distresses me when I see people trapped in jobs they hate or in unhappy relationships who feel powerless before forces that seem to dictate the direction of their life. That gets me worked up. I react quite viscerally to this. So if the content I teach can be a resource to empower people to gain more freedom and control of their lives, I'll be happy with that. All right, let's wrap up here. Let me summarize the points I've made about the ways that curiosity can be a resource for critical thinking. First, knowledge that is acquired through self-directed learning that is motivated by curiosity is more lasting and more accessible than knowledge acquired through rote learning. So if we can find ways of cultivating genuine curiosity about a topic, that's good for critical thinking. And second, we can distinguish interest motivated by genuine curiosity, which opens us up to new experiences and new ways of looking at the world, and what I called partisan interest, which is really concerned with reinforcing and defending the boundaries that form our identity. We're all some mix of different motivations. No one's interests are purely partisan or purely driven by curiosity. But people will have different default settings, either as a generic personality trait or with respect to specific topics. When partisan interest dominates our motivational psychology, it has a distorting effect on our reasoning. It feeds confirmation bias. Genuine curiosity, by contrast, has a positive role in creating relevant background knowledge, and it has a debiasing effect by urging us to see individuals as individuals in all their complexity and particularity. So that's good for critical thinking. The caveat here is that if curiosity dominates one's motivational psychology and partisan interest is low, as it tends to be for me, then in my experience, this can have a detaching effect. This might be good for one's psychological health. Just ask a Buddhist or a Stoic about the value of detachment. And it's good for critical thinking. But it may not always be desirable, all things considered. Some issues are worth getting worked up about, and some causes do need defending. Okay, well, I hope you found this discussion helpful in some way. And I'll close with a reminder that if only 5% of you listening to this podcast were to become sustaining members or Patreon supporters, I wouldn't be rich, but I could do this work sustainably. If you want to see the Argument Ninja program become a reality and the rest of my work to continue, please consider becoming a supporter. It is remarkable how the numbers from small pledges can add up. Some of you I know follow Sam Harris's podcast. I'm a patron myself. I look forward to those episodes. Do you know how much he makes from his Patreon supporters for each episode that he publishes? About $11,000. This is from a base of around 4,400 supporters whose average pledge is less than $3 a month. $11,000 per episode. Recently, he's been publishing almost weekly, four episodes in December and then four episodes in November. So you do the math. He's not hurting. I don't begrudge him his success at all. He works hard and he's got a big audience. 
For me, it's just inspiring to see how effective fan support and crowdfunding can be. So if you'd like to become a sustaining member and help support this podcast and my work, including the development of the Argument Ninja Academy program that I've been talking about on the podcast, you can visit the support page at argumentninja.com or criticaltheoryacademy.com. There's a menu link called support for both of these sites. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. And I'll talk to you again soon.